Et euh, maintenant, euh, sans aucune illusion, je passe la parole à Holger May. Alors, Holger May, we are going to switch to English with Holger. Uh, he could speak uh, German, uh, which would, but, but he, I, I can tell you that he speaks excellent uh, English. Uh, his, his French is uh, not yet as good. So we will move to you, uh, Holger. You are a very old friend, and um, you are a great uh, technology expert. So we have covered a number of aspects of technology uh, during the last three days in various uh, sessions. So I am sure that you have something new to tell us. Well, let's see, but uh, I want also to pick up the title and illusions. Uh, some year or so after 2014 and the annexation of Crimea, I um, had a dinner with some um, parliamentarians, including from the Foreign Policy Committee and the German Parliament. And uh, well, the guy said, well, we were then all disappointed by Putin and disillusioned about Russia. I said, well, my spontaneous reaction was, well, you can only be disillusioned if you had illusions in the first place. Mm. And how can one have illusions about Russia, I, I wonder. Um, also, probably for your private life, it's a good recommendation, not if you don't want to be disillusioned, don't have illusions in the first place. Um, 24th of February this year, our foreign minister, um, Baerbock, um, said in the early morning, now we broke all up in a new world. And here we go again. I, I wonder in which world she was living before, probably in a world of illusions and wishful thinking. And in particular in the Green Party, they had a steep learning curve, um, as you might have observed. I think one of the key problems was the lack of understanding of the continuous role of military power in international relations. There was so much talk, in particular in my country, about soft power and civil power and everything. But if I have three generic scenarios, and in particular with referring to Russia, if Russia falls apart, I think we need lots of forces to manage somehow the chaos in the East. Exactly. If Russia regains strength and becomes confrontational, antagonistic to the West, we need lots of forces for containment and deterrence. We did that during the Cold War quite successfully, and a Cold War is a million times better than a hot war. So nothing wrong with that, but we need military power. Now, my preferred scenario is Russia one day becomes a friend and partner to the West. And I say, well, then we need a lot of military power. And people look at me, why that? And say, because we need to be a strong part partner of Russia and never ever be a weak partner of Russia. And I think those who understand that best are our Eastern European friends and perhaps also in the North. Um, referring to Finland, I think Finland during the Cold War, we were all blaming for Finlandization, which probably sort of Chamberlain's appeasement politics, but I think they understood that it doesn't make sense to kick the Russian beer into whatever every second day, but every other second day, the Finns reminded the Russians that uh, during the winter war for one dead Finn, there were 10 dead Russians and they probably shouldn't try that again. I think this is exactly how to talk with Russia. It's, um, um, you know, um, speak friendly and carry a big stick. And I don't blame the German governments for seeking cooperation with Russia, Russia but I blame them for not doing it from a position of military strength. And I don't blame them for buying cheap gas in Russia, but I blame them uh, having allowed to become fully dependent on it. Um, and that's, I think, the problem. Militarily spoken, it's never put all eggs in one basket. Now, history I would interpret as a combination of continuity and change. And with the end of the Cold War, it, well, of course, it wasn't the end of history, right to the contrary. It, History was back, as we saw in the Balkans. Um, basically, everything that happens today, we know very well from history. It's very little surprise if you look at the Peloponnesian War and read that book. I mean, it's, it's actually current day-to-day -day politics, I guess. Um, so in a sense, if you take continuity and uh, change, we are, in one way, um, can refer to the Roman Empire plus cyber. Yeah, there's something new like nuclear weapons, uh, 
something new in the tech sector like, like nanotechnology, biotechnology, robotics, artificial intelligence. But my military friends told me, well, why should the Russians ever attack with tanks and artillery? They can do it with cyber. And of course they use cyber, but they also use tanks and artillery. Um, so I think we forgot about worst case analysis, which I think is pretty sound to do and wonderful if it uh, turns out to be better. But I think the analysis should be, first of all, worst case analysis. And most of the younger officers, they you know, start writing in military journals and magazines, and they always start, well, we with the Army, we the Air Force, we the Navy, systematically prepare for the most likely scenarios. And I think this is a big mistake. You should prepare for risk. And risk is the combination of the product, actually, of likelihood times damage level. And you should look at the low probability, high impact scenarios. Um, and I think we, in, in particularly in Germany, completely failed to do that, as you see when we start dismantling our military and now have to rebuild it. Um, you don't have the fire insurance because it's so likely that your house burns down. It's because of the consequences, and that's what we need to keep in mind. And so we prepared our armed forces to be efficient for peacetime and unfortunately forget to prepare them to be effective for wartime. The German armed forces have an ammunition supply for, believe it or not, for two days of war, and, and then it's over. So this, this, is, this is quite sad, and so I would submit this is the world <coughs> of illusion that has to be over now, and uh, like 2,000 years ago when we had no democracies but republics during long peacetime periods, they never paid enough on defense, and then later on paid with money and blood. Thanks. Thank you, Holger. Five minutes and 40 second, 48 uh, seconds. So uh, we have time to ask you a more specific question. Going back to our own uh, past, when we were working together with uh, Albert Volsetter on uh, some uh, scenarios, war scenarios in the 80s. Actually, in the 80s, it was at the after the first oil shock, and in those years, the uh, Americans, the US, and us, the Europeans, were discussing a scenario of what we used to call the one and a half war. That was the idea of uh, having to conduct a, a, a major uh, confrontation with the Soviet Union, plus a regional war, and that was in the Middle East, in those scenarios, uh, after the, the first and the second uh, oil shock. Today, the situation is different, but my question is the following one. Um, you uh, mentioned as one possibility the collapse uh, the, that Russia, the Russian Federation, falling apart. This actually was about to take place in the 90s. And this is why the Russians wanted a strong man to come in, uh, in power. Uh, but suppose this scenario uh, happens again as a consequence of the uh, continuation of the uh, one, pos one of the possible scenario with the continuation of this war. Now, uh, Russia could fall apart either from within, that could be uh, as the Soviet Union fell in uh, 1991, or it could be uh, falling apart as a consequence of the extension of the war. And uh, from the Russian viewpoint, uh, the uh, justify, Putin tries to justify his uh, invasion uh, by the fact that he felt threatened by the increasing Western activities in Ukraine to, 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 to do it uh, uh, shortly. So now, if there is a scenario like that, in your judgment, don't you think that it could be a case where the Kremlin could consider that it's the vital interest of Russia are at stake, which could therefore justify, uh, from their viewpoint, the resort to nuclear weapons? I'm talking of a scenario which is very, very different from the scenarios that have been discussed in the past few weeks? Well, let me first of all say that the reason why I took these scenarios, which I took 
take us entirely generic, is because I wanted to show that no matter what happens, it has to do with military power. And it's very sensible to have military power as an element in, in international relations. So if I would advise the planners and the armed forces is um, plan in a way that the result is largely insensitive to huge assumption variations. I mean, it's going to be perhaps a different enemy than you thought. He might be stronger than you thought. He might have weapons you didn't know he had them. He might have allies you didn't know they get along with each other. They might use tactics and methods that are against international law, but they do it anyway. Um, so I, I have to prepare for all these things. I mean, soldiers always act into the unknown, and they are trained for that, and they need the, men yeah. the mental uh, furniture for that. And, and so, yes, indeed, it might be they might request to nuclear weapons. I would not exclude that. How likely it is, I don't know, but uh, we better are prepared for that. And the better we are prepared, the less likely I think it, it will be that they do that. But one of the scenarios, or the most important scenarios we were looking at the Cold War, and we also try to look at it the same way now, is that, okay, the Russians uh, want to conquer and they don't want to destroy what they want to occupy. They say, what if this assumption is wrong? They don't want to conquer, they just want to destroy. Mm -hmm. They want to get rid of your opponent. Um, and I think Putin made it very clear. If, if Ukraine wants to become a member of NATO, there won't be any Ukraine. And, and for me, it was absolutely beyond any doubt that if Ukraine moves closer to the West, Russia will attack. I had absolutely no doubt. I, at the time, I had to admit I could be wrong, but now I know I was right. Um, and, and, and the question is, okay, could we have been prepared differently? Yes, I think so. In particular, Germany could have not sent seven Panzer Howitzer 2000 to Ukraine, but 70 because we had enough, but we didn't have enough. So, uh, I mean, yes, I mean, we could have been prepared differently. Uh, but the, the scenario, again, is um, look at worst case. And um, the recourse to nuclear weapons, I would definitely not exclude yeah. at all. Um, again, despite the question of likelihood, but it's the typical low probability, high impact scenario, definitely. Thank you very much. And uh, talking about the end of illusions, maybe the most, uh, the, the, perhaps the most profound interpretation of this is to remind that history is indeed tragic. Rappelons-nous ça, l'histoire est tragique. Okay.